Welcome to the Rock and Roll Research Podcast, where we share the super cool backstories and side gigs of the research and insights pros that you trust. Today, we welcome Joel Primer to the podcast. Now, Joel currently works in B2B data sourcing for the mighty Kantar, which is one of the world's largest data insights and consulting firms with over 25,000 people in over 75 countries. That's pretty big. <laughs> well, <Huge. all> right. <laughs> That's right. Now, prior to the Cantar, uh, I think it's notable to say that Joel lived through all the M&A merger days of Research Now and various iterations of eRewards and SSI and now Dynata and all that good stuff. Uh, he's also worked for Nielsen, amongst others. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that, you know, he when he was growing up, it wasn't research that he really wanted to do. I know he was really excited about music and got pretty good at it pretty quickly and that continues to be a passion to this day so we're going to talk about all that and more on today's podcast welcome to the show joel right on matt thanks so much for having me yeah right on super excited to have you super excited yeah those are those are crazy heady days uh in the the yeah. sample, sample merger mania so uh, yeah it, it was pretty wild um it, it was a wild ride and actually back before research now uh I got into research working for Nielsen. And prior to Nielsen, I, I was not working in research at all. Uh, I was, we're talking about, here's the back, back in the 90s story. Yeah, yeah. Back in the 90s. Let's hear it, man. Not, yeah, not only was I playing in bands and multiple bands uh, in the New York area. See, I'm in California now, but I'm originally a, a Jersey guy uh, for better and for worse, I guess. <laughs> I was in the publishing industry in New York. And then uh, after, after that, I ended up getting hired by Nielsen to do business development for Nielsen BookScan, which that was part of their scan ah, companies. Okay. You know, yeah. for those of us who are in the music industry too, you may have heard of SoundScan and yeah. VideoScan, right? That, so BookScan provided point of sale data aggregation for, uh, for the publishing industry. I also started doing some some custom research work with some of the researchers there based on that data. And so I started getting interested in some things and saw what using panels, online panels were all about, as opposed to just doing, say, uh, phone research or, you know, in-person intercepts. Right. So, uh, and that eventually, since I was a, a customer of, say, Greenfield at the time, see, we're going yeah. back. <laughs> and, and e rewards. Yeah. Uh, the, and I met some of the Research Now people uh, from the UK, the original Research Now, and they were getting set up here in the United States and they were building up this hub in San Francisco. Um, and that led them to hiring me and moving me. I didn't know what I was getting into, though. I just, <laughs> oh, sample. Yeah, this is great. Um, <laughs> they moved me out to San Francisco. Uh, and that was around the same time that another podcast guest of yours, uh, Emmanuel Propst. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Just, yeah. He was that. working. Uh, he moved over to the U.S., right? He was working at Research Now in, in Chicago. So a yeah. uh, little, little name drop there. So, <laughs> yeah, heady times indeed. Um, and I, I've been living in the San Francisco Bay Area ever since. So that was, what, 16 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, going through the acquisitions with eRewards. And uh, so being part of the whole eRewards community and uh, those guys, from like really 2009 or 2010 onward and growing with them. And then they were taken private, then they were bought by private equity. Uh, and then going through all the mergers with Survey Sampling International. Uh, being right. part of that. So, you know, the whole time I was there, I was in client development. I was an individual contributor, uh, manage a team anywhere from four people. At one point, it was like nine different reps I was managing. That was really, that was really fun. Yeah. Um, and I also worked for a little while after that at, for a, a, full, a small full service company and then came to Kantar because the Kantar folks actually maps, marketing and planning systems. They were an old client of mine. 
And uh, they had a really great opportunity to be in a strategic uh, operational role in the brand strategy group. So that that's kind of the the 50 cent tour. <laughs> so I'm no longer in sales, which is okay. I kind of miss it sometimes. Yeah. Um, but kind of taking on this uh, strategic operations role and, you know, flexing and learning some new and different things just keeps yeah. me growing and keeps me engaged in research and uh, interested in what's next. Yeah, yeah, super cool. All right, so you've you've alluded to it a little bit here. So, I mean, East Coast <laughs> is definitely a place for music, right? New York City, New Jersey. Yeah. So let, let's hear about how that developed and love to hear uh, a band story or two. Okay, well, let's see. I, I mean, I listened to a ton of great music growing up in the, I'm going to date myself here in the 1970s. You know, I, I tell people I've been playing guitar since the Carter administration. You know? <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> one of those guys, right? Oh, geez, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, I started at a really young age, and it's not like, oh, yeah, there were, and I wanted to rock, man. I mean, <laughs> there's no two ways about it. No. Um, you know, I was, I had an older brother who was a mathematician and super you know, involved in academics, and my parents were academics and everything, and they're like, was this guy want to play guitar? <laughs> they didn't know what, what to make of it. Um, and, you know, I'd heard a lot of music, not so much just in my house, but also I had older cousins and, you know, other kids in the neighborhood, whatever. It, it just kind of filtered through. There's a lot of great music in the 70s. You know, you're talking about the first stuff I'd hear was like Elton John, you know, <laughs> Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Uh, obviously all the Beatles stuff. Um, anything you can think of that was really hot at that time going back. Um, uh, Frampton Comes Alive, that was later though. Man, that was a real <laughs> catalyst for me. That made me really want to play guitar. I mean, this is like, sure. this is incredible. Uh, Kiss, obviously, like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. what, what kid didn't didn't like Kiss? And, you know, later on it was like Led Zeppelin and all that. So, you know, I started nylon string Yamaha guitar that my mom borrowed from someone, okay? <laughs> like, is he really serious about this? Um, Cause I had piano lessons and stuff. Right. But one of the things I remember, Matt, that was so interesting, I, I'm not, you know, like patting myself on the back here, but it, it just, it made me a little different as a guitar player, um, as a youngster, was that I really aspired to play it in tune, right? from from the very beginning like get it really uh, i don't have perfect pitch I, I i'm not one of those people but like really perfect tune so that you know fixing the intonation so it would not offend your ear <laughs> so it would sound good from the start even if i can only play like three things it's like well, right. i'm gonna play three things i i want them to sound good so that that's really what i aspired to do uh so by the time it was like fifth sixth grade i already had like a, a les paul copy and a little amp and I was starting to go to some of those summer music programs and getting into uh, some cool bands with, oh my God, kids who are in high school. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I see like a little hint of recognition there. there, there it sounds like it, it's something that we all kind of go through. So the, the kinds of things that, you know, a high school band was playing in like 1979, 80, 81, it, you know, like cover stuff, um learning like black sabbath tunes right yep. uh rush oh my god yeah. huge, like we're talking aspirational things i was trying yeah. to learn how to play uh the whole moving pictures album <laughs> right wow <laughs> <laughs> I know. well maybe a little less aspirational um learning songs by the cars some of the easier early tunes by the police sure. um you know, whatever was on the radio at the time, the MTV stuff, right? <laughs> so yeah. it's new wave to metal. Um, and so I was in a bunch of bands, you know, in, in middle school and then in high school, a whole, a whole lot of stuff going on um, that really explored a lot of that territory. Sure. And I know you and I, when we, when you and I had first talked, we talked a lot about the new wave of British heavy metal bands and mm -hmm. some of the more obscure things that were going on. But that, that came for me more like around 82, 83, getting into like, ooh, Iron Maiden. Like, yes. who's ever heard of Iron Maiden, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
you know, mentioned Overkill because they were a local band to me yes. in New Jersey where I was growing up. Um, Anthrax to see in New York, and wow. you know, and when I first met those guys, I'm like, wow, they're they're all they're they're like Scott Ian. I was taller than him. I'm I'm not yeah. a tall guy, so I, I have these bigger than life personalities. But yeah, um, so it was not that I was necessarily part of that scene, you know. I was more like kind of on the periphery of it, like kind of poking it <laughs> a little, but, you know, going to the shows and being influenced as a musician um, by all that, by all that thrash stuff. But at the same time, the flip side of that was um, somebody put a picture on Facebook uh, a little while ago when I was in high school, a bunch of us at South Mountain Reservation at the Waterfalls. This is in Northern Jersey. And we're all like playing acoustic guitars, like singing Crosby, Stills and Nash songs. So, yeah. <laughs> so That's awesome. it, it really, yeah, it covered a lot of ground. Um, so that was really like the beginning of that. And eventually in college, I was in some original bands. Um, I went to Rutgers and there was a, a really great scene there. Right. Uh, in New Jersey, it kind of extended around, you know, there was, uh, it was a great time for indie bands. Yeah. Um, there were groups like um, uh, Mud Honey and Soundgarden, like when yeah. they were still like on SST label, that yeah. would actually come through town. <laughs> I'm a huge SST fan, it was my favorite label for sure. Oh, right on. Well, wow, well, glad I mentioned it. But it, that was the kind of thing that was that was going on. I mean, it was really yeah. it, it was happening right right in front of our faces <laughs> seeing yeah. and, and kind of feeling being a part of all this. And I think just a little sidebar, um, I, I was talking to somebody recently about scenes, you know, oh, well, what was the punk scene like? Or, you know, what was this scene like in New York versus, you know, this other college town somewhere, you know? And their response too is that these days, maybe there are some scenes the way we used to talk about them, but to have scenes, you have to have people kind of getting all together and congregating and, and yeah. artists interacting um with musical and and otherwise and i don't know i'm just not so sure that you know the there are online communities but i think there's some lack of scening i don't know what we want to call it <laughs> have, have you noticed anything like that yes yeah, certainly i th i think it's it's sort of structures differently now like the, the music and how people interact with it and uh it has structured differently right i've noticed it from being in a band back when I was in high school as well. Uh, and a, just a quick sidebar, because he mentioned some things. So I started playing because of Neil Peart from Rush. Yeah. That's why I started playing drums. <laughs> Everybody who's about my vintage uh, is, pretty much makes that claim. It's either him or John Bonham. Uh, and then, of course, you mentioned some real, like, formative days for me where Anthrax and Overkill, just that whole early thrash scene. It's just super yeah. Um, but now that I'm playing in a band again in Dallas, it feels very different. Um, um, although there there is a scene per se, but it's 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 not so much like it was, where it was kind of like uh, you know West Side Story with the Jets and yeah. the whatever. You know, everyone's got their scene and they move around in packs, and um, you know if you're not adhering to all these things, you're a poser and blah blah blah. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there there was a lot of talk like that back yeah. then and yeah, totally. uh, <laughs> you know the the scene police right <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. um and it, and in other genres of music too it, it it wasn't just in rock and you know pop music or you know punk or whatever or, or yeah. even metal you have the police and you know in classical music and uh, famously you have the jazz police too <laughs> and that's it's a very very real thing yeah so, totally. Totally. Yeah. But aside, aside from any, you know, anyone patrolling, <laughs> I would say that eventually uh, it got to the point where, you know, I started in with my, um, my working life and I ended up playing in, in bands on the side, but it was also unclear what I was doing. Um, and eventually a guy who I had known from Rutgers contacted me and said, Hey, um, 
I'm playing in a band with, uh, this was New Jersey, remember, okay? He said, I'm playing in a band with Clarence Clemens' son, Nick. Okay, oh. so Clarence Clemens, yeah, the sax player from the Bruce Springsteen band. Wow. And uh, my friend Bob, yeah, Bob Ramos, who's he's now a, uh, you know, uh, a Latin studies professor at Rutgers, but he's a consummate drummer, and he, he was a scene drummer, <laughs> he played in a lot of bands, um, and a great Latin percussionist. Um, he said, I'd like for you to come and see this band and, you know, just check it out. Tell me what you think. So went out, saw the band. And I really liked, I liked Nick. I liked what they were doing, some good songs. And he asked me my honest opinion later. I said, you know, I didn't love the guitar player so much. Okay. He's like, well, that's good because we're actually looking for someone. And how would you like to come and, and play? I said, what? Oh. So I, I auditioned, um, just went down to this warehouse in Jersey City and um and i was hired <laughs> and eventually the idea was that maybe you know i'd start writing some songs and kind of be a participant you know in um in the group uh you know so there's the difference between are, are you like a hired hand versus are you actually being involved in the writing so right. uh, it, it the idea was that it would evolve from that and um nick was a good guy and a, a good songwriter he's an acoustic guitar player and a singer um and so as a result of that you know i got to meet other people in the e street band and also uh you know his dad uh clarence clemens would come down and play with us actually do gigs with us um <laughs> that's crazy yeah <laughs> yeah it, it was it was pretty crazy so uh places like uh the downtime in New York City, which is uh, next to one of the rehearsal buildings that I think is still there. It was a pretty cool club. And um, I remember one, it was like a Thursday night. Uh, I think we were playing there with a, a couple other bands. Um, there was an opener and a guy who was just a, a fantastic blues guitar player. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we were just all glued to him. And Clarence Clemens was sitting there with us and the guy was I guess he was offering people to you know to come up and jam or whatever so Clarence picks up his horn gets on the stage and the guy was like oh my god <laughs> he was like, yeah, man, come on let's play but yeah he he really did like to play and there were a lot there were shows that we did um at like Meadowlands Racetrack with Smithereens that was a really big oh, one. Oh, cool um, I love that band yeah oh they they were also, that was when Pat Denizio was still alive, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to say we played with him in Boston, Pittsburgh, um, uh, West Palm Beach once, <laughs> although I yeah. don't, don't remember much about that. Uh, but I do remember there were a couple of shows at the Stone Pony um, in Asbury Park, New Jersey, big club yeah. you may have heard of, uh, Stone Pony Summer Stage. So th these were really exciting, exciting gigs to be on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they'd stretch me as a player and working, you know, with the band. There were some jammy moments. It wasn't like a jam band per se. It was more like, here are the songs. We've got arrangements. Let's, you know, make everyone sound good and look good. Um, and he actually had a development deal with Sony. So it was really like the first time um, and manager. So it was the first time I, I was making music, you know, as an adult, you know, <laughs> going into my 30s and actually like, like not losing money, <laughs> <Like breaking even. laughs> but you know, I had to make a decision uh, at some point, um, and you know, which way is this going to go? You know, uh, after a couple of small tours, you know, we did fly-ins and West Coast and that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, uh, I I'm glad I made the decision I did because <laughs> I wanted to be a family guy and I saw what some people go through trying to yeah. have families and just not even be around for them. Um, yeah. So yeah, that I, I've seen guys I knew are just going through a lot of pain <laughs> and, and I just, I couldn't see being that person, but you know, so I, I aspired to be involved in music, maybe, I didn't see it at that point as like, oh my God, I'm giving up a dream. <laughs> you yeah. know, it was more like um, being at a different age. I saw, I saw some things just very differently, you know, as you grow into an adult. And like, this is what I like about this industry. These are the people who I'm going to have to associate with. And there are some great people, but there are also some aspects of it that 
I, I didn't like, which we don't have to get too deeply into here. We're talking about <laughs> what our passions are, right? <laughs> I want to inspire people. So um, very long story short, that was, that was the, the journey. And it was kind of around toward the end of that journey where I was just starting to work at Nielsen, believe it or not. Got so, it. Yeah, that yeah, was cool. that was the time there. Yeah, that's uh, that's crazy. So I'm, I'm really curious since you really had a very different, pretty unique perspective. I think coming into the industry, um, is there anything? What what do you think you took from that experience as you um, entered the research industry? What did, what did you learn from music and that you've applied? Well, let's see. I think. I mean, there are some obvious things like teamwork, for example, you know, you can have some great players in a band, but unless there's cohesiveness and everyone's really on the same page and clear about what the goals are, uh, there's just going to be tension. And at the end of the day, if there's that kind of tension in your team, you're, you're not going to have success at right. all. And it's, it's like, and it, it applies to sports, it applies to business. And you've got to have that kind of uh, agreement and uh, that communication, uh, the ability to um, work cohesively together, uh, the ability to compromise, just sure. things that we all try to learn and aspire to, you know, even in, you know, things that you learn in school or when you're on teams when you're younger or whatever, but all of that is completely valid and carries yeah. over. Um, I'd also add that, you know, technical execution um, in research, I think that accounts for a lot, but, you know, also keeping people coming back, you know, what keeps the clients coming back? It's how, how they feel at the end of that, that research study, you know, it, did you give right. them what they need? Did everybody look good? Did everybody feel good? Um, is there also this door open to more, you know, right. and what's next? Um, yeah, I was thinking about this. I, I also want to say that the best music, the best tunes, um, they, it, it, the music takes people somewhere, you know, even if it's like jazz or jam or, you know, fusion, whatever it is, um, it, it's got feeling it's going to take people somewhere and it's going to tell a story. And likewise, uh, in our field, I think so does the best research really. Um, yeah. you know, you're delivering something is just kind of effective, you know, it might not be good enough these days. It's, uh, I think bringing, you know, that certain level of connectedness and authentic authenticity to it, really being able to articulate a story well, uh, is going to take your research further. Yeah. Here, here. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, uh, so let's, let's talk again about, um, I mean, you've got this great experience. I mean, you, you, you switched to research. You went through all of that merger mania, right? <laughs> <laughs> Curious to know at this point in time, uh, if you've seen so much change in the time that you've been here, uh, what does the future look like for research? What's, what's maybe going to become important or is, uh, is important now? Now, I work primarily in quant, okay? So I'm feeling like, the respondent experience has got to be at the center of everything that's going on. I mean, yeah, you can have a research design, but you have to really put yourself um, in the mind of the respondent, put yourself in their, in their place, in their shoes, uh, because the advent of mobile, especially ever since what, 2013, 2014, and we've seen those numbers of mobile penetration is when it comes to, well, who's, who's responding to online surveys and where they, right. where they using? Um, that's one big situation, but it's how do we keep people engaged? What are the tools that we're using? And, you know, there are some great uh, platform companies, software companies that have, have created some amazing tools for respondent engagement, but to me, you know, we can't ever, can't ever lose sight of that, you know, and data quality, we can talk all about crummy sample quality and people complaining about that, but th it really is a shared responsibility as well. It, it's, yeah. uh, data, you know, creating a really compelling survey that's going to create a great respondent experience is not going to mitigate massive fraud that's out there with click farms or whatever, but it could help 
cut down on people who are legitimate survey respondents just kind of getting bored right yeah, and, yeah, and, and not really wanting to participate you know for this for research to continue we need we need people to participate so we have to go meet them where they're at and and bring them something good you know it's not yeah. it's not entertainment but it needs to be engaging right yeah, that's right car can't go without gas right <laughs> <laughs> And, and now, I mean, you, you've got so much competing for people's time. For some reason, I think consumers for a long time really felt, I don't know, somehow obligated, maybe because it's similar to polling. Um, I don't know, but for many years, it was, you know, people did surveys because they felt like, you know, it was the right thing to do. And now, yeah. you know, you're competing against everything for everybody. Oh, my time. God. Yeah. yeah, it's competition for eyeballs now. Uh, it's not just competition for someone's time watching TV. It's what app are they on? Or, yeah. you know, I, I think the rise of TikTok has yeah. just just been huge. And, and that's just one of many. Um, yeah. But I, I also I think about these things in terms of, OK, how are we going to source respondents? See, we have to go to where the people are. Well, where are they hanging out? You know? Yeah. Yeah, so speaking of TikTok, curious to know, um, and, uh -oh. this is, and this is a podcast, of course, I'm curious to know what media you choose to consume with your uh, limited time. Oh. Have, what's uh, what's Oh, wow. Well, where to start with that? Um, I think these days, uh, you know, I, I don't have a heck of a lot of time to consume as much <laughs> as I did once upon a time. But uh, I think uh, visually YouTube uh, for music, yeah. concerts, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a guy named Rick Beato. H have you ever heard oh, of yeah. Beato? Huge. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. All right. So you, yeah, you know, nice. reach into the choir. Uh, I mean, I don't necessarily agree with all of his opinions, but I, I really do think he's fantastic. He's a great communicator. Um, a, a great musician. Uh, he's an educator. And the thing that kind of strikes me about him is he, he is a great interviewer. He's a music fan and he knows how to engage his own heroes in, in communication. And yeah, that's a good them. point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so I, uh, I think that would be a cool thing for, for people to check out and music fans or, you, you know, you don't have to be a musician to appreciate what he's doing. He, he really brings it down to a very accessible level, uh, which yeah. is great. Um, and there's another YouTube channel that I really like. Um, it's kind of a plug for guitar players. It's a series by a guy named Tom Bukovac. Have you ever heard of Tom? Nope. Okay. So he is a renowned Nashville session musician. Um, and the series is called uh, Homeschooling. <laughs> and I think, I don't know for sure, but I think he started this uh, during the, the lockdowns, during the pandemic. Sure. Um, we just started doing this. And it's really entertaining, informative, so so darn cool. It's really one of the best things that, for me, I, that I've seen on YouTube. I mean, this guy has played with everyone. Um, he was a touring guitarist for the band Heart, you know, the Wilson oh, sisters. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, he was also in a band that I really like uh, called Trigger Hippie uh, with Joan Osborne, uh, Jackie Green, and Steve Gorman, who was the drummer for the Black Crows. Yeah. Started this okay. kind of a side project. So Tom was one of the players in that. Um, so he's a fun guy, seller player, uh, Tom Bukovac, great YouTuber. So so here's a question I really want to know. Everything's kind of a lead up to this one, Joel. I'm just <laughs> always fascinated about the answers that come from this, often surprising. And um, I'm very curious to know what your answers might be. So it's a classic desert island disc question, right? So you're stranded on a desert island. Mm -hmm. You've got three records at your disposal to keep you company oh. for the rest of your days. What are they? Only three, man. Only three, that's it. Matt, you're killing me. I mean, <laughs> well, three is better than one. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, some of some of my answers may surprise you. Uh, yeah. I would I would start with uh, the first solo album by David Crosby called "If I Could Only Remember My Name." Okay. Okay. Absolutely incredible. Uh, it was one of those outstanding releases from 1971, and a lot of people rediscovered it later. Everyone is on this album. Um, the writing is 
genius David Crosby who left us recently, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I've seen him with CSN and, you know, and even solo concerts and have some stories around that too. Um, but the Grateful Dead is on that album. Uh, members of Santana are on that. Uh, Joni Mitchell's on it. Um, Jefferson Airplane, <laughs> like all, all these people kind of get together in different incarnations and execute these songs with uh, incredible heart and feeling and just outstanding singing. Um, and in an interesting twist, the album was cited uh, by the Vatican <laughs> as one of their top pop albums of all time. <laughs> so, um, okay, well, it's good enough for the Pope, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Good enough, for the Pope. good enough for and, <laughs> uh let's see the second one i'd have to think it, it would be a Joni mitchell album um okay. either either blue but that's kind of a standard answer so i probably lean more toward Joni mitchell's hijira which was her 1976 uh work where it was the first major release maybe aside from weather report to feature jaco pistorius um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, the, the songwriting is just, it, it was outstanding. It's really one of her major works and uh, highly recommend it. She was a, a huge influence on my approach to uh, altered tunings and guitar playing and acoustic sure. music later on too. So uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can listen to that on a desert island and still hear new things yeah. every time you know, even just on those, those two album sides. Uh, the last one, let's see that the last one would have to be something more in the jazz fusion realm. Sorry, I, I'm not including any thrash there. <laughs> that's, all, that's all right. <laughs> I, I don't have, uh, you know, I'll, kill I'll visit or... you. I'll visit you with her with a record. <laughs> okay, cool. You'll, yeah. you're, you'll be in the boat with the big speakers blasting rain and blood and you know, can, <laughs> there you go it, that's right you can you know i can hear it echo from echo. Water. <laughs> okay that's that's awesome um for the for that last one i would probably go with something fusiony maybe um uh, i'm gonna go with jeff beck who also ah. left us recently uh yeah. probably the blow by blow ah, classic okay all instrumental uh you know he covers stevie wonder tunes uh you know the beatles he, he he covers a lot of ground there uh produced by george martin just incredible playing uh huge influence and again it's the kind of thing that i i listened to it again recently after jeff beck passed away after not having heard it for a number of years and uh, it it still stands. <laughs> I mean, undisputedly, um, always something interesting to hear there, always hearing new things. So there yeah. you have it. Awesome. Great choices. Great choices for sure. Um, and really, <laughs> it's, always, it's always interesting for me to have guests on here that uh, got much further than I did in music and really did the thing and still found research it's, after all, right? You know, it, it's it's interesting. You know, the, the footnote to a lot of this is, um, uh, the high school I went to, which was uh, Columbia High School in Maplewood, New Jersey, uh, Maplewood and South Orange, it was just about 30 minutes outside of Manhattan. So I'm not sure what it was. It was sort of on the borders of like suburban and urban, but there were a lot of people there who have got like the drummer in Ween, you know, Claude Coleman was the classmate of mine. Wow. There, there were uh, other folks I know, a guy, Mike Geegan, who is, who, played with you know Michael Jackson and who's an in incredible musician and has toured really extensively um uh, yeah. you know I, I don't mean to be name dropping there's a there's a guy who's also worked with uh Lenny Kravitz and has produced wow everyone who you, you can't even imagine so um you know I it it must have been I, I don't know, some sort of some sort of fertile ground that encouraged it wasn't an art school by any stretch of the imagination but yeah. I think it's it's um, just having exposure um, to to lots of culture, um, yeah. you know, may, maybe in a way that's a little different than say when you have kids growing up in, you know, Austin, for example, or yeah. or LA or or something. Um, 
maybe some different exposure and different opportunities and that kind of thing. So sure. who knows? <laughs> sure. Cool. Cool. Well, this has been a really cool chat. Joel, uh, we definitely have to stay in touch. We've got some more metal. Yeah, I, th I think we need a part two where you uh, get to weigh in on comment and all this. <laughs> there you go. That works. Cool. Awesome. Well, let's talk soon, Joel. Really appreciate it. And rock and roll. You got it, man. Ah.